everyone uh, you're very welcome to this evening's webinar uh, it's the seventh in our in our series of the family webinar series and tonight i'm really delighted to be joined by frank smith frank is a clinical nurse specialist working with us on our anxiety disorders program and he's going to be talking tonight about supporting a loved one with anxiety and um, so really glad to see you all joining in tonight um, just a couple of things to just to recap there will be some time at the end for questions so feel free to pop them in the Q&A box. The webinar will be recorded um, as with the other sessions in the series and in the coming days they'll be uploaded to the, the website. So if, um, if if at any stage you feel like you need to take a break or you know there, there's maybe difficult emotions coming up at any stage um, feel free to take a break Know that you can come back to it at a later stage as it is recorded and it will be available as a resource to you on the website. Um, but as I said, there'll be time at the end for Q&A. Uh, so without further ado, I'll ask um, Frank to join us and we'll get kick started um, on tonight's topic, supporting a loved one with anxiety. Uh, hi everyone, just trying to turn my camera back on here. Uh, doo -doo -doo. It's... Uh, uh, the button getting in the way every time I go to turn it back on. Hold on. Ah, oh, there we go. Now, hi, everyone. Um, Frank is my name. Thanks very much for that, Elaine. Um, yeah, and as Elaine says, I work on the Anxiety Disorders Program. Uh, I'm going to talk to you today about um, supporting a loved one with anxiety. Uh, and I'm just going to start sharing my slides here now. Uh, can everyone see that? Not coming up just yet, Frank. Okay, hold on, I'll go back to it here. Da -da -da. Share screen. Here we go. Now. Okay. Um, is it coming up in white there? Yeah, it's coming up yeah. in white. Yeah, we're good to Lovely. go. Brilliant, thanks very much. Um, so just, I suppose, a quick a quick rundown of what I'm going to talk about uh, today um, in the webinar. I'm going to talk about, first of all, what anxiety is, briefly, just to, to, to get an idea of what it is that we're, we're, we're working with. Um, I'm going to talk then about the kind of excessive or disruptive anxiety that's characteristic of, of some mental health difficulties. Um, I will talk about the treatment of anxiety and, and some of the options available for, for the treatment of excessive anxiety. Um, I'm going to talk then about my, my own um, area of work, uh, specific anxiety disorders, which is, are, you know, a specific uh, group of mental health disorders um, characterized by anxiety. And, and then I'm going to talk a little bit about kind of general guidance for supporting someone with an anxiety disorder and some of the things that can that, that can help us to support someone working through or, or um, coping with an anxiety disorder. And finally, um, there's some time for questions at the end. The uh, anxiety is a symptom of a lot of different mental health difficulties. So specific advice is difficult to give um, so if anyone has any specific questions they'd like answered, I'll, I'd be happy to answer them. Um, so yeah, so first of all, we'll, we'll, we'll just look briefly then at, at what is anxiety. So anxiety is our response to a potentially difficult or threatening future event or situation. Um, so basically, we're constantly making sense of our world. And if we see something in our future, that's perhaps threatening or going to be very difficult for us, we'll start to feel anxious in anticipation difficulty. Um, so it helps us to identify and, and deal with threats before they can hurt us. That's the job of anxiety. That's, that's why we experience it. And that's, that's its intended purpose. Um, when it's working right, it, it helps us to identify and cope with threats before they can hurt us. Uh, it's very helpful when it occurs in the proper context. So when we're anxious and there is potential threats, anxiety 
helps us to perform better. It helps us to concentrate more and on the appropriate things to kind of uh, navigate these difficulties. Um, and the way it does that is it involves physical changes in the body. So your body physically, it operates very differently when you're anxious or, or afraid. Um, it involves cognitive changes. So your thinking process, the way you think changes when you're anxious about something or you perceive a threat. Um, and, and that's why you might notice if you're anxious about something, you probably find it you might find it quite difficult to think about anything else. So if you have a job interview tomorrow, or if, um, you know, you have, say, are awaiting the results of a medical test, you, you might find it quite difficult to think about anything else. That's because these things are perceived as potential pitfalls. So the anxiety, the fear response says, right, we're going to put all our cognitive energy into trying to kind of think our way out of it um it involves emotional changes so they're very unpleasant i'm sure familiar emotions of anxiety and fear that make it quite difficult for us to be in such to stay in situations that we perceive as threatening and do nothing um so if we think there is a uh, potential danger whether it's social danger physical danger whatever it is uh, anxiety and fear make it quite difficult for us to just do nothing about that and then of course, when we're anxious um, or fearful, we start behaving differently. Um, so I'm sitting here talking to you now, and it's grand if there was something anxiety provoking. Uh, to give a silly example, if there was a lion out in my garden here, I wouldn't be behaving the same way I am now. I'd be running outside and, and trying to jump over the wall, maybe. And anxiety is closely related to fear and the fight or flight response, and fear is the response to imminent danger. So just to kind of give you an example of the difference between anxiety and fear, they're closely related. Anxiety is when there is no perceivable threat immediately. There's no imminent threat. Um, we will feel anxious, but we know that there is a potential threat. Um, fear is when there is an imminent threat of, of, of harm to us in some way. So when I read in the newspaper that uh, the lion has escaped from Dublin Zoo and has been spotted in my neighborhood, but I look out the window and I see nothing, I might start to feel anxious. I can't see anything threatening, but I know there's a lion somewhere around. Fear is what happens when I look out the window and I see him sitting on my patio and, and licking his lips. The, the threat is imminent. It's there. It's, it's tangible. Um, so that's how fear and anxiety are related. Um, here are just some causes of, our, of anxiety or fear, and I suppose the important thing from, from our point of view is that these things, um, some of you may feel kind of um, sympathize with the people or, or the, you know, feel a, a, a bit of anxiety about the pictures here. Um, the important thing from, a, I suppose, from my point of view is that none of these situations are inherently dangerous, dangerous but there, there may be common sources of fear all the same or anxiety that, that these are things that cause anxiety, even though they're not dangerous. Um, so there is just a small kind of enclosed tunnel. Um, someone with claustrophobia might find that extremely anxiety provoking or, or fear pr provoking. Uh, the thought of having to go through something like that and not being able to turn around and not, not leave as soon as you want. Even though that's not dangerous, it will feel extremely dangerous maybe to some people. Uh, here's a view from a very tall building, a fear of heights, uh, anxiety around heights um, is again something that maybe someone here might might have be familiar with. And what may be difficult about this for someone would be they might be afraid that when they're up high that they're going to fall. They may be overestimating the likelihood that they are going to fall when they're in a high place or that they're going to get dizzy and faint or, or um, something like that. Uh, here is a little house spider, maybe not that little. Um, again, this is something arachnophobia, I'm sure people have heard of or, or may, may, may have themselves. Uh, I apologize if anyone is feeling a, a tingle up their back from, from this picture, but house spiders, they're big, they're kind of, they don't look the nicest. Um, they're not dangerous, but they can be a huge source of fear and anxiety for people. Um, 
and and even people without arach without arachnophobia might get a jump when they see a spider. Um, human beings were were kind of hardwired to feel fear around small things that move very fast and scuttle along the ground. So even if you're not afraid of spiders, just seeing that movement in in the side of your vision might give you give you a jump. And public speaking then and public speaking again is probably a common enough uh, source of anxiety so if I know I have to give a big speech tomorrow to loads of people um, I might be feeling anxious if I'm standing up in the podium I might be feeling fearful or or afraid and if we talk about this in the context of something like social anxiety which is a fear of negative judgment um what would be happening here is all the people that I'm talking to in front of here, I would feel more at risk of being judged negatively because there's so many people listening to me. And that's, that's why public speaking can be, can be quite difficult for people. Um, they, you know, the more ears, the more chances someone's going to hear something I say, think it's stupid, or they're going to see that I'm anxious and then they're going to judge me negatively for that. So they're just some, some relatively common um, sources of anxiety. But again, like I said, the key thing about all these, so the public speaking, the spider, the heights, the enclosed space, none of those things are dangerous by themselves. There are people who can do any of those. There's, there's people who can do any of those things and not battle eyelid. There's the person I'm sure we know who can pick up the house spider and just bring them over to the window and put them out. Um, I'm not that person now myself, but there, there are people that can do that, no problem. There are people who can stand in front of a podium and speak about anything. I always think of Barack Obama and how, how confidently he spoke. There are people who can go into those tunnels. Those tunnels are actually a tourist attraction in, in Vietnam, the Kuchi tunnels. And there are people who will go in there out of interest to enjoy themselves. Um, and there are also people who, who go in there and feel terrified. And the same with heights. There are people who are looking over the balcony and in, in that big building in Dubai and loving it. And there are also people who are absolutely terrified. And this, this kind of brings me on to, um, I suppose, the mental, the mental health side. with with anxiety and like i said circumstances it focuses us it gives us a bit more energy than we usually have in physical situations it it you know the fight or flight response is allows us to fight harder run faster um it really when there is danger around whatever the type it is anxiety gives us the best chance of navigating it it it, it puts all our resources into navigating it safely um, and that's a good thing so i'm on the top of my game when i'm doing a job interview if I experienced the, the appropriate amount of anxiety. Um, if I see the lion, God forbid, in my back garden here, um, I'll be able to jump a bit higher, run a bit faster, fight a bit harder because of the anxiety fight or flight response. Um, where we run into a problem in, in mental health is when people start to experience excessive anxiety um, or, or anxiety in a way that doesn't help them, that actually disrupts their ability to live the life that they want. And when we talk about excessive anxiety, we talk about things like feeling anxious when there is no significant danger or difficulty. Um, so feeling more anxious than a situation may warrant. And some of the kind of I suppose cognitive reasons for this is we may be overestimating the likelihood of harm or the likelihood of something bad happening. So um, an example of that would be of overestimating the likelihood of harm is someone with, uh, let's say, who's giving a best man speech and is thinking that they're going to ruin the whole wedding with it. It's, it's a possibility. It's extremely unlikely. Um, the reality is most people listening are on your side and, you know, you're happy, whatever kind of things you say. Um, and then there is overestimating the severity of harm. So 
this is where, yeah, something might happen, but people are thinking that it's going to be far worse than actually would be. So to give an example of, 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 of someone overestimating the severity of, of harm or the severity of outcome, if I am talking away here and I tell a joke and it falls a bit flat. Now, I, I can't actually hear anyone, so I wouldn't even know if it fell flat or not. But let's say that's the, it falls a bit flat. Um, I might start to worry then, oh, God, the webinar was a disaster. Everyone's going to complain and I'm going to get in big trouble in the hospital. Uh, again, that's it's a possibility. It's probably highly unlikely um, that the reaction to a, a bad joke would be that severe. So I'd be overestimating what's likely to happen if I if people do react to, to, to a poor joke. It's more likely that they just won't laugh or, or say, oh, that was rubbish or whatever it might be. And just to say then as well that excessive anxiety, so ex excessive or, or disruptive anxiety is a very common symptom in a lot of, of mental health conditions. So there are primary anxiety disorders, which I will discuss in, in more detail now as I, as I go along, but anxiety and an excessive disruptive anxiety, it's an extremely common symptom across a wide range of, of mental health difficulties. And I'll, I will, I'll, I'll talk a little bit more about that um, later on in the presentation. So here are some of the, I suppose, mental health and, and difficulties, and I suppose life difficulties that can cause us to feel an excess of anxiety. Um, so the first one, and these are, this is the area that I work in, are, are primary anxiety disorders. So these are things like social anxiety, which is uh, a fear of negative judgment by others. And so people might experience social anxiety in very specific conditions. They might have no problem chatting to people in the coffee shop or chatting to, you know, people in the lunchroom, but they might feel extremely anxious going into, say, job interviews that they're going to go red or they're going to sweat or they're going to say something silly. Other people might have no problem talking in uh, professional settings like job interviews or giving a lecture, but they might feel extremely anxious let's say, talking one-to-one -one with someone or making conversation with an acquaintance, like a friend of a friend, they might feel extremely anxious that, they're got, that they won't have anything to say or that they're going to come across as anxious, obnoxious, weird, some other negative thing that they're going to put out there by, by interacting with people. So people with social anxiety have, a, have a, a kind of a heightened fear of negative judgment or negative scrutiny by others. GAD then, or generalized anxiety disorder, is characterized by excessive worrying and catastrophic thinking about future outcomes of uncertain events. So the person with GAD tends to kind of think the worst in, you know, in a, in a wide range of areas. So for the person with GAD, if they ring someone uh, and they don't answer, they might be thinking, oh God, what if it was an accident? Oh God, what if they're in the hospital? Um, if they are, they're booking a holiday, what if I book this and it turns out to be rubbish and everyone is annoyed with me? Um, what if the car breaks down? Uh, uh, what if the interest rates go through the roof and I won't, I can't afford my mortgage? So, you know, the person with, with GAD might hear an, a thing on the news about, about the economy and suddenly they're sitting there worrying about being homeless because they've thought, what if the rates go up? What if I can't pay my mortgage? What if I'm evicted? What if I can't get somewhere to live? So from hearing that one article, they've already traveled down the, the anxiety road to um, thinking and, and feeling anxious about homelessness, even though that's miles away from where they are at the moment. So, so that's generalized anxiety disorder. Um, it's, it's, not, it's not anxiety about nothing. It's, it's anxiety about a lot of different things. And it's, it's kind of thinking, trying to get ahead of problems that may or may not happen. Uh, OCD then, obsessive compulsive disorder, is uh, it, it's a wide ranging uh, difficulty uh, characterized. The, one of the most um, visible ones would be a fear around contamination. 
So a fear of an excessive fear of contamination. So if I touch this door handle here and I have um, a contamination OCD, I might worry that I've got a contaminant on my hand. I might compulsively wash my hands to get rid of that then. And I might feel extremely anxious that I'm going to pass that on to my family or make someone else sick. That's contamination OCD. There are, are lots of other types. Um, obsessional thoughts then are, are kind of intrusive, unwanted thoughts. For the person with OCD, they can feel very distressing. So an example would be if I was visiting, say, the Cliffs of Moher with my friend and we're both standing there, the thought might pop into my head imagine you just pushed your friend off there and the thought might pop in. I'd never, ever do it. But for the person with OCD, they might think, well, why did I think that thought? And they might become very distressed that this means they're a bad person, or this means that they're going to lose control and do something like that. So they might run away from their friend or they might, you know, avoid going places like that. Um, or there would be responsibility OCD. So someone with a kind of a responsibility OCD might be walking along see a crack in the paint in the house and feel compelled or you know compulsively have to go into that house and say it to the person because they'll feel that if they don't that they're being reckless if they don't warn the person that there's a crack in the, in the, in the front of their building so there are just some of the different types of ocds there's there's many many more um panic disorder then is anxiety or fear um based on on kind of the catastrophic misinterpretation of the physical symptoms of anxiety so the person with panic disorder maybe might notice their heart beating in their chest they might then think um i need to calm down here if i if i get any more anxious i could have a i could have a heart attack my heart could mightn't be able to take this strain and then that thought then makes them more anxious which then makes their heart beat faster so then they start to feel like why can't i calm down oh god here we go and it becomes a vicious cycle. And that's what we call a panic attack, where some um, not dangerous, some, I won't say harmless because it's very frightening, but yeah, like a, a, a non-dangerous physical symptom is thought of as dangerous. And this then becomes a vicious cycle. Agoraphobia then is the fear of being trapped, either trapped in a place where they can't, where someone can't get to the exit easy, so easily, such as sitting in the middle of a crowded cinema where you'd have to push past 20, 30 people to get out if you needed to, or it can be a fear of being trapped away from a safe place. So such as um, the further someone gets from their house or the further someone gets from a hospital, they might feel more and more anxious because they think something terrible is going to happen. I need to get back to my house as quick as possible, or I need to be within running distance of a hospital because I'm in danger. H health anxiety then is a fear of physical illnesses and uh, characterized by kind of constant checking information seeking around physical illnesses reassurance seeking then from from medical uh, medical personnel and then you, you have your specific phobias things like a fear of dogs a fear of heights a fear of driving uh, blood injury phobia emetophobia which is a fear of vomiting all these specific things that people can be excessively afraid or anxious about so that's one cause of of, of excessive anxiety depression is another huge um, cause of excessive anxiety and um, it can often it, anxiety is such a common feature of depression that often people with depression might feel that anxiety is their primary problem because it's so prevalent and the way that anxiety or depression can cause anxiety is various it can it can be agitated first of all it can make us feel very restless and, and therefore anxious but depression can also take away a lot of the kind of uh things that we make use of to get through uh, to get through everyday life so depression can cause us to sleep badly so we have low energy it can take away our motivation poor concentration it can take away our enjoyment from things. So I go if I go down to the shop to get my breakfast every morning and suddenly I'm feeling depressed, the, the thought of that trip to the shop might seem overwhelming. It might say, I can't face this today. I If I bump into someone, I might burst into tears. I'm just not able for this today. So the thought of going will fill me with anxiety. Um, 
psychosis um, or, or kind of psychotic mental health disorders can also be a huge source of anxiety for people. So if someone is seeing things that maybe aren't there or has beliefs that people are out to hurt them, um, such as with paranoia, of course, they're going to feel extremely anxious because they'll think there's a, a real threat there. Um, and then certain kind of personality difficulties, personality traits can also um, cause us to feel excessively anxious. So some examples would be uh, low self-esteem can cause people to feel very anxious when they when they when they don't need to or when there there isn't a, a threat. So if I'm giving this lecture and I have low self-esteem and I think I can't do anything right, that I'm absolutely useless. I'm going to feel quite anxious about doing this because I'll, you know, I believe that there's that this is going terribly and I, I feel anxious. Things like perfectionism can also cause us to feel excessively anxious. Um, if you think about someone with perfectionism, with extremely high standards, let's say if they're to simplify it, someone is aiming for 100 percent in all their exams. Um, every exam, they're, they're going to feel really anxious because there's only one way to to pass it and that's get 100 and there's 99 ways to not pass it so to the perfectionist the threat is failure and there are so many ways to fail when you set your standards that high so someone with perfectionism will often feel dread about projects in work or essays or things like that because they know when that they get into it it's going to be such an amount of work to try and achieve the standard they've set um and then things like excessively stressful life, life events, like when we have a huge amount on our plate, things like illness, work-related stress, stressors, interpersonal difficulties, these are all things that can cause us to feel very anxious in a way that can be disruptive to, to our everyday life. So, so they're just some of the, the, the things, the conditions and states that we'll be in that can cause us to feel excessively anxious. So just to talk a little bit then about the treatment for anxiety, um, the first thing I'll, I'll say just to build on what, what was on the previous slide there is that it's important to treat the cause of the anxiety and not the symptoms. So this requires a accurate diagnosis by, by, a, you know, by a, a medical professional. And why I say that is because the treatment for anxiety that's caused by depression is going to be very different from the treatment for anxiety that's caused by say social anxiety disorder um and both of them are going to be very different from say the anxiety that's caused by low self-esteem or by psychosis so the real important thing while anxiety is a very unpleasant symptom the most effective treatments are the ones that target the reasons why we're anxious and not just the anxiety itself and that requires us to you know to that requires kind of assessment that requires um engagement with with um with mental health professionals to to kind of get that to ensure that we're working in the right area so medication um has a role to play in 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 the treatment of anxiety so antidepressant medication um can be very effective for both anxiety that's there as a result of depression and also for anxiety um, as it relates to anxiety disorders. So um, the, the first line kind of pharmacological treatment for anti for uh, anxiety disorders is, is antidepressant medication. And I'll talk a little bit about CBT in a while, but um, and antidepressant medication can be very valuable in getting people to a place where they can engage in psychotherapeutic or behavioral work to, to deal with um, an anxiety disorder. Uh, benzodiazepines then are a medication that would have previously been used quite a lot to deal with excessive anxiety. Um, they are still there in some cases of acute anxiety, um, and but they're generally a very short-term solution at the moment. And the reason for that is Benzodiazepines will reduce your experience of anxiety. So if you're an, if you're feeling extremely anxious, <coughs> excuse me, um, a benzodiazepine like Xanax or Valium will reduce that anxiety in the moment, but it doesn't do anything to address the causes for the anxiety. So 
to go back to my example of a phobia of dogs, let's say, if I have to walk past my neighbor's house and they have four or five dogs, um, I can maybe take Valium and I won't feel anxious and I'll be able to walk past the dogs. But my fears around dogs won't have changed at all. It'll just be that particular time. So benzodiazepines reduce our experience of anxiety, but they don't change the reasons why we're anxious. So that's why they're not effective in the long term. And also they have high potential for to be habit forming and um, increased tolerance. So what works to reduce your anxiety today won't be enough tomorrow and that can keep going. So they're not really a, an effective long-term treatment for, for anxiety. Um, cognitive behavioral therapy then uh, is a, a well-researched and well-evidenced treatment for both anxiety disorders and, and anxiety caused by depression. Um, the basic theory behind cognitive behavioral treatment of anxiety disorders would suggest that it's, you know, it would, it's about supporting the person to learn more about the things that make them anxious and hopefully learn through experience that these things aren't the way the anxiety says they are. So again, to give the example of the, 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 the person who is afraid of dogs, um, cognitive behavioral therapy would identify why and the thought might be dogs are going to bite me. Again, that can be true very occasionally, but you could walk around every day for, for two years, um, as some of us have done over the course of the lockdown, and, and never be bitten by a dog. So that's a thought that, that's distorted, um, that you can challenge by, by helping the person be around dogs, by, by um, exposing kind of themselves to, to kind of dogs they're afraid of, and then discussing it afterwards. Okay, what were you afraid happened would happen? versus what actually happened. So I was afraid he was going to bite me. What happened? He licked my hand. So it's very hard to maintain those kind of distorted ideas when something else is happening. So if you're around, again, this is very simplified, but if you're around a lot of dogs and all they're doing is licking your hand, it's very hard to maintain the idea that they're going to bite you when it's not happening. Um, our, our brain rebels against that. It says, I'm wasting energy here by being anxious about getting bitten. I've been here for an hour and it hasn't happened. Maybe I can, I can, I can turn this off. And then other modes of psychotherapy can be very helpful. Um, as can psychology with, with anxiety that maybe comes from places like perfectionism or low self-esteem. Um, again, examining certain personality traits. Um, and some examples will be things like compassion, fo focus therapy, acceptance and acceptance and commitment therapy um and then uh things like dialectical behavioral therapy can also be very effective in in treating anxiety that's maybe related to to personality styles or personality traits so just to talk then about specific anxiety disorders um i've i've given an example of a few of them there the the, the social anxiety the panic gad and that so just to talk a little bit about them they are characterized by frequent feelings of anxiety and fear based on a distorted ass assessment of the level of danger that a person is facing. So the person who feels who's breathing heavily in the in the in the shopping center and think, oh God, I'm going to faint again. That's a distorted idea of how likely we are to faint because we're feeling anxious. Anxiety does not cause us to faint. Um, but for someone with panic disorder, that's exactly what it might feel like. They might feel lightheaded. Um, and think fainting is imminent unless I get the hell out of here. Um, so, an examples of some of the distorted assessments, as I said, a person with a phobia of dogs, maybe overestimating how likely dogs are to bite us in everyday life. A person with a fear of heights, maybe overestimating the likelihood of falling if they are in a high place. So if you're up on the Burj Khalifa in Dubai, it's high, you might feel a bit lightheaded, you're no more likely to fall up there than you are standing on the edge of the waterfall down at ground level. You're actually less likely because there's big glass things up there, but the person with a height phobia may feel like they're going to topple over or something. Um, the person with an anxiety disorder knows logically that the fear is excessive, 
However, threat will still feel re very real when the motion is high. And, and this is an important part as people, you know, who are maybe supporting someone with an anxiety disorder. It's not like it's not a, an information problem. It's not that the person doesn't have the right information about dogs or about about heights, whatever. Logically, people with anxiety disorders know that this anxiety is excessive, but the fight or flight center, the anxiety part of the brain, when that emotion is high, it can make anything feel real. And it will make in the moment, it will make the threat feel real. So the person who's with OCD who's afraid of contamination, the threat of um, illness on the door handle feels very real when anxiety is high. So, um, and, and again, you might have experienced this yourself if you've been in the cinema or on Netflix watching a scary film, and there, it gets to a very scary part. You or someone you're with might be like this, and you know you know it's only actors. You know it's only lights and sound on the screen, but your fear response will kind of can override that and say, "No, this this is real. Freddy Krueger is there, or Jack Nicholson is there," and you might feel the need to go, or you might feel the need to turn it off. So anxiety, even when we know something is isn't really dangerous it will make it feel dangerous and distorted cognition so these ideas that are causing us to be anxious are then reinforced through some of our coping mechanisms through avoidance and safety behaviors so the person who's afraid of dogs who thinks that dogs are going to bite them when they walk down the street and they see a dog coming the other way they cross the road and their anxiety goes down They've dodged a bullet. And what happens there is they, they, they manage the emotion, they manage the anxiety in the moment, but they never learn that that dog wasn't going to bite because they're never, they never get close enough to find that out. So the, the, angst, the anxiety causing cognition stays in place. If you cross the road every time you come across a dog, you will never learn whether they bite or not. So if you have that thought, that thought will stay in place. So often the things that people with anxiety disorders do every day to manage their anxiety actually reinforces um, the thoughts that are causing it and also prevents us learning anything new that might be of help to us. Um, so anxiety disorders, they're the most common of mental, mental health disorders. Um, according to the American Psychiatric Association, anxiety disorders affect nearly 30% of adults at some point in their lives. And usually there's a long time between onset and commencing treatment. And I think in, in some research I recently read, I can't remember which anxiety disorder it is, but the average time between onset and seeking um, treatment is about 10 years. So people will live with anxiety disorders for a long time before they um, start to look at, at changing, um, changing or, or seeking treatment. And, you know, 30% might seem a little high in terms of adults suffering. Um, so that's one in three of us nearly here will suffer with an anxiety disorder. But often we maybe suffer with an anxiety disorder that doesn't impact our life significantly. So say something like a phobia of spiders or heights, they can be quite accommodate, well accommodated in everyday life um, without, you know, they don't disrupt our ability to go to the shop, say. Um, so, so people will often have, you know, you know, a, a, a quite unpleasant phobia, but it doesn't disrupt their life. So they don't, they just, they, they contain it and accommodate it uh, in some way. So just then to talk then about supporting someone with an anxiety disorder. So I don't, there are so many different anxiety disorders. Um, there are so many different conditions outside anxiety disorders that cause anxiety. I don't want to give specific advice um, about, you know, engaging in treatment because it, it varies depending on why the person is anxious. So these are just some general um, guidelines for kind of, um, you know, supporting someone with an anxiety disorder. So the first thing is, is to cultivate empathy. Um, and, and why I say that is what we are experiencing in this situation is not what the person with anxiety disorder is experiencing. So when we are sitting outside the job interview and we're feeling a bit anxious, but we're okay. And the other person is there and they are, 
maybe you know excessively anxious it's not the same job interview the situation's the same but their assessment is completely different and therefore their emotional state their cogn cognitive state their everything will be very different so to go back the spider in the picture is not the same spider for everyone for some people it's a little cute thing for other people it's the worst thing in the world um so it's important to to cultivate empathy for people who who are experiencing high anxiety in a situation that maybe we're not too anxious about and the way i recommend to do that is to think about something that does cause you a high level of fear or anxiety and it can be it can be something like it can be it can be something that where you know it's excessive yourself like a fear of spiders or whatever or it can be an actual situation so like if you were to cross the 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 m50 at rush hour that's that's what the person with the anxiety disorder is experiencing in this situation so it's important to be empathetic and and and, and recognize that that our experience and the person with the anxiety disorders experience are not the same they're not they're not the same and it it, it can be it, it it's 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 unrealistic to expect um someone with an anxiety disorder to approach something in exactly the way we would um an important thing then is to facilitate and support treatment such as psychotherapy um uh assessment all of those things so like i said there are a lot of different treatment options anxiety is very very treatable um it can require a commitment of time a, a commitment of effort so one of the best things we can do as someone who's supporting someone with an anxiety disorder is as much as possible facilitate and support them attending their 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 cbt or their psychotherapy their assessments um uh facilitate time to do cbt homework if that's on the table all, all that sort of thing so you know supporting and facilitating treatment is 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 invaluable um discuss safety behaviors and reassurance seeking removed from the crisis situation so this is a, a big thing so like i said often the behaviors we call them safety behaviors that people use to um manage their anxiety actually reinforce and make it worse over time and so does reassurance seeking so if someone with anxiety is constantly you know looking for reassurance that things are okay that's done to to reduce their anxiety and it can be very effective but long term it also leads to an, a decreased tolerance for for uncertainty so um it's the way I, i'd say this like is it's it's when you're in the ring with mike tyson isn't the time to learn how to box you know you're at nothing and when someone has high anxiety is in the middle of a panic attack is in the middle of a a, a contamination crisis episode is in the middle of a social anxiety kind of crisis that's not the time to discuss how to approach it it's 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 really important to have a plan that's made when things are aren't at their worst so it can be very helpful to sit down and discuss particularly if the person you know the loved one is is part of the safety or reassurance seeking process so if say for instance i have um i have contamination ocd and uh, i i maybe when i feel anxious i insist that my family members wash their hands what can be helpful is is to sit down when i'm not feeling anxious and maybe discuss you know in terms of maybe some therapy that i'm doing how we might so i might say like well when i ask that maybe maybe don't wash my hands maybe try and talk me through it so so come up with a, a plan that we can enact then during the crisis thing but it's it's better to come up with the plan um outside of the crisis situation um support the person and not the anxiety disorder know the difference so what i mean by this is again with high anxiety a lot of the stuff we want to do maybe isn't that helpful in the long run and, and particularly if someone is engaging in therapy so if someone is doing therapy for their anxiety disorder just be aware of how helpful or or um hurtful of the therapeutic process reducing the anxiety is so so to give an analogy um if someone is giving up cigarettes and they're feeling really distressed 
a way to reduce that distress and and as as kind of a loved one we'll want to reduce it we, we hate seeing people in distress but we might think oh god i can't i can't stand seeing them like this i'll give them a cigarette and that will reduce it it will but it will also um impact their 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 kind of work to date um whereas not giving the cigarette it, it, it can hurt us like because we again we don't want to see people distressed but we can maybe help in other ways support the person acknowledge how difficult their things are feeling for them but try try not to kind of support the anxiety disorder by by engaging in safety behaviors or or reassurance giving or you know in whatever the the thing might be try to try to support the person to get through the difficulty rather than trying to reduce the anxiety by by using the safety behaviors or whatever it might be um help and and these these last two ones are are kind of linked so what i would say is to try and promote and facilitate experiential learning around the subject of the person's anxiety so if someone is afraid of heights one of the, the best things we can do is, is make it as easy as possible for them to learn through experience what, it's, what it is to be up in a high place. Because that's when they're anxious up there, that's where someone, when someone feels like they're in danger, that's where they will learn whether they are or not. So you, you can't learn anything valuable. If you're afraid of heights, there isn't anything particularly valuable in reducing the anxiety that you can learn on the ground you have to be kind of up there and in that anxious mindset because it's in that mindset that the the learning that will get you out of it comes so to promote and, ex and facilitate that experience and learning wherever possible um is is very valuable and that's not to you know it's it's not a, a kind of a sports coach thing where we're saying right get up there now and, and learn about that or it's you know it's just making it as easy as possible for the person to do it when they want to and and as part of their therapy um again like these things can be a source of huge um tension between loved ones so um i think you know don't get into that thing of you know this is what we'll do next xyz because that can that can feel um very difficult and it can it can actually impact impact learning um but certainly promote it make it as easy as possible to experience and learn the things that the person is anxious learn about the things that the person is anxious about and then just to support and reinforce any positive changes and any kind of move towards learning about this situation so if the person with with panic disorder um you know goes out for a walk um away from the house for the you know and and doesn't doesn't um have someone with them you know that's something to support and, and applaud um if if someone you know comes and says listen i want to go to the shops by myself today or i want to prepare the dinner without um without uh washing my hands 25 times they're the things it's it's those things where where the person is kind of approaching the, the the subject with curiosity rather than 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 trying to be as safe as possible that's the stuff to reinforce to to applaud and to support them doing um and again to you know to do that in a positive way it's um as i said above what we're experiencing and what we see is happening is not what's happening for the person so we see walking across the road for the person with with the anxiety disorder it might be that they feel like they're walking into a war zone um so just remember that and you know just support and reinforce it in a positive way and and make it as easy as possible for people where where you can um there is a series of books the overcoming series um they they i know they're available in the information center in the hospital there are uh, a series of self-help books for various um mental health disorders there there would be a lot of them around anxiety disorders they're very good for people with anxiety disorders to read but they can also be really good for for um loved ones to read as well if 
they want to kind of understand more about the specific thing that their their loved one is going through and if they want to be a part of any um you know cognitive behavioral work or whatever that person might be going through um and that is everything from me in terms of the information Thank, thanks very much to everyone for for listening um and yeah any questions i'm i'm happy to answer thank you so much uh, Frank and so well timed. <laughs> oh. um, really a clear and comprehensive presentation. Um, we might get, give it a minute or two if anybody, there's no questions so far in the Q&A box, but um, I know myself, I was intently listening, so maybe not thinking so much of the questions. So if anyone wanted to ask any anything, um, please feel free to pop a question into the Q&A box. Um, us and we'll give it a minute or two but yeah so really helpful frank to have gone through the different kinds of oh um so oh sorry i don't have a that couple Q &A of questions box. coming up um okay <laughs> so they're all appearing at the one time um so i i suppose i might start with um frank you mentioned about um the different kind of identifying the cause of anxiety and and one thing that came like the different kind of variety of of um causes that can be involved somebody's wondering what dysmia is and whether you could explain oh that. this this time yeah um so so this time is is a term for kind of i suppose it, it would be a term for i suppose agitated depression might be the the best way to to describe it and that's probably the term i would use it's i guess it's 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 where our mood is and where we want it to be but it mightn't be that kind of low energy depression that maybe we you know that low energy kind of low motivation um side of depression it might be a very restless kind of high energy depression as it were so it's it, it can have characteristics of of depression but the energy might be high and, and restless so it's not a pleasant high energy it's it's more kind of a, a an unpleasant restless kind of energy okay. that would be yeah but it's 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 um yeah it would be related to mood yeah okay this time yeah thanks frank and there's a couple of questions about treatment i suppose people are looking about how to access treatment but also where to find you know qualified therapists or if this is a particular place that people should look yeah yeah so um obviously in St. Pat's, we 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 have uh, we have the anxiety disorders program, which is 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 um, catered specifically for anxiety disorders. It's a CBT based program, um, and there would be there there is individual CBT available there. Um, when I'm asked about engaging with with um, I suppose CBT, where to find qualified therapists. I am currently recommending the BABCP, the British Association for Behavioural and Cognitive Psychology or Psychotherapy. Um, that could well change in the next couple of years with Koru, and um, it's going to be kind of what's the word regulated in Ireland. So there may be an Irish version too. There already are some Irish accredited crediting bodies being set up, but at the moment I say look at the BABCP website. That's the the one that's that's in place, and they they maintain a list of Irish qualified therapists. But keep an eye out as well, um, because I, there there will be an Irish um, accrediting body coming down the line soon through through uh, Coru and that. Yeah. Okay. Thanks, Frank. And just there's a question about getting help through the public system, and I suppose I would say the best protocol is to start with your GP, and then they can establish whether it might be suitable to refer to something like CAMS, or if this is the person is referencing that, or whether something like primary care services might be uh, suitable for for the adolescent or adult. It depends on the individual case, but I would say the GP is probably the best protocol. Um, there's a couple of questions, I suppose, about the relationship between anxiety and and I suppose you touched on this already Frank but the relationship between anxiety and post-traumatic stress disorder yeah yeah and and it's I, I probably should have um put PTSD in that link of, or in that list of anxiety disorders we we don't um treat post-traumatic stress disorder on the program because it's so individual to the person and 
Um, it involves uh, a treatment for post-traumatic stress involves very individualized kind of work with the, the specific traumatic events or with the complex events. Um, but it is an anxiety disorder. So uh, post-traumatic stress can result in, in huge levels of anxiety, uh, uncontrollable anxiety, um, <clears throat> things like flashbacks to the traumatic event or to, you know, you know, or feeling in threat when something is only superficially similar to something that's traumatized us. So they are very, I see Carol has asked that they're, they're yeah, they, uh, PTSD is an anxiety disorder. It would be one that you that is is quite specific in its treatment. Um, we're we're okay. quite lucky in this country that in Belfast there's um, a lot of research into PTSD and and its treatment. Um, obviously because of of the troubles and things like that. Yeah. Okay. And uh, Frank, there's just a couple of questions around supporting somebody specifically and like things not to say, but also something that I suppose we often encounter as mental health professionals is, you know, the balance for families to be struck in knowing when to push a person and when to be led by them in terms of, you know, what they feel they might need in the moment. I suppose a little bit like what you're saying about when you're trying to assist somebody stopping smoking. But, you know, is there any kind of specific advice you might give in terms of trying to get that? balance yeah yeah so um i would say the, the the probably the most important thing to do is 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 to maybe you know through the person suffering with anxiety to maybe engage in 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 a meeting with their with their whether it's their therapist or their their doctor to to understand a bit more about where, what's going on and and to understand the overall treatment thing the overall treatment plan um, would be the most important thing because, again, knowing knowing when to push someone and when not to is that's not just hard related to anxiety disorders. That's that's a that's a whole skill of in in lots of areas of life. I I'm I'm a rugby coach and I have grown men bigger than I am that I. I've, I've pushed and it hasn't worked. You know, they've, they've, they've stopped turning up to matches and I've had other people who I haven't pushed and have been, and they've stopped turning up to matches as well. So, you know, it's, it really is individualized. Um, and it would be hard to answer that um, without knowing the specific person that we're talking about. So I'd say the best thing to do is to, through the, the service user or through the person dealing with anxiety, link in with their team, maybe have a family meeting, something like that where where you can understand what's going on in terms of the overall treatment plan that that would be my advice there okay yeah. and frank i might just take one last question um and it just because i know a lot of your presentation is really related to adults but is there kind of any specific um resources you would recommend for children with anxiety i know personally from my own experience that john cherry has done some really helpful work on supporting parents to support a child with anxiety uh, now this participant is saying health anxiety specifically um but there is there anything that comes to mind um i i think what you said um Elaine about about the GP is is probably the best thing I mean there there's cams cams have access to like the treatment the the evidence-based treatment for health anxiety is uh CBT so it would be to access that through cams through the adolescent service in St. Pat's but it, it, it the first steps would be the same it would be about accessing uh, a quality assessment through either cams or through 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 St. Pat's or, or whoever it might be to to cut because that's where the that's where the referral will, will will come from so I would say an assessment is is the place to start and then to seek referral if you're looking like treatment in terms of psychotherapy um cognitive behavioral therapy is 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 well evidenced for for the treatment of health anxiety yeah okay brilliant um 
Thank you, Frank. So I think that's probably all the questions we have time for today. Um, but again, if anybody has any specific queries, um, please do not hesitate to get in touch with our support and information line, um, which is publicly available information. And, and that's a good source for signposting you towards specific resources. Um, but thank you all for joining uh, tonight. And uh, the slides and the, the, re the recording will be available in the coming days on, on the website. Um, so please feel free to check back to that. And thank you, Frank, for joining us tonight. Everyone Thanks very have a good much. evening. Thanks, everyone. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.